Operating pressure of a, a modern cartridge is anywhere from 30,000 to 60,000 PSI. You know, it, it's a heck of a lot of pressure inside of uh, the detonation of uh, gunpowder inside of a cartridge. Uh, you know, you compare that to an air rifle, it's 3,000. You know, 3,000 sounds extremely high when you're pumping it up, and it is, you know, but compared to what a modern rifle cartridge is, I mean, it's, it's nothing. All right, what is up, everybody? Got a fun one for you. One that I'm personally very excited about, Jim. Now, I'm excited about it because of the topic. Okay. Uh, I find it really interesting, but I'm also excited about it because of the person. Because across from us virtually right now is Mike Scobie. Uh, from the Outdoor Sportsman's Group. Now, Mike is a longtime friend of mine. I know him from way back in my Washington days. Uh, took me under his wing back in the day, taught me a lot about the outdoors. We did a lot of hunting and fishing together, had some really cool adventures, uh, spent some time at Cabela's uh, together as well. Actually, Mike was pretty much the catalyst that, that brought me east, if you will, my first venture east. And uh, yeah, Mike, so before we get too deep, into the topic that we're going to talk about, which is going to be air guns and air gun hunting. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we hear a little bit about a little bit about you and what you have going on? Well, thanks, Mark, and thank you for inviting me on this podcast. No, you're right. You and I go way back. I, I count you as one of my oldest friends, probably not in numbers of years, but numbers of years we've known each other in the industry today. I mean, I knew you when you were in college, and I remember staying at your frat house, going hunting together, and we both went to the same university, and uh, it's been a long, long time ago. <laughs> and then, obviously, had some great hunts uh, in Nebraska over the years, and hunting with legendary guys like Ray I down in Missouri for turkeys and fishing, and a lot of, you know, a lot of our formative years of figuring out how to do things, so we go way back, but uh, yeah, since, I mean, we worked together at Cabela's corporate office, I've moved on, I've always been a writer, um, Wrote books back then, was an editor for Cabela's, and then went on to be editor-in-chief of Peterson's Hunting for a decade, and uh, essentially the longest-running editor except for Craig Boddington. He uh, beat me out by a year or two, and then uh, three years ago, I got promoted in the same group to our group publisher overseeing all of our shooting titles, so most notably Guns and Ammo, Shooting Times, Firearms News, Rifle Shooter, Handguns. Uh, our entire SIP division and all the properties associated with that, both print, digital, uh, television, uh, podcasts in some cases. So oversee the brands of, of all of those various shooting titles. But my love has always been, you know, more of the hunting side of the business, but also a very big firearm enthusiast and collector. So, Yeah, no, for sure. No, Mike is, uh, Mike is very, uh, very knowledgeable about, about darn near every facet, which I guess that might explain why you oversee about a billion different titles and various platforms from print to podcast and all that good stuff. But yeah, I mean, I think we could have a, we could have a podcast series, Mike, about our adventures and, and maybe possibly some of the antics along the way, but definitely some of my very, very best memories, Jim. Oh, I'm sure. Sounds great. I didn't realize I was in the room with there well, in the room, both in person and virtually with two kooks. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Two kooks. I don't know if you can see the, the hat. I'm just, um, just going to have to join in and just say, go Cougs, I guess. Thank you, Jim. Why not? Appreciate it. Mike, I don't know if you can see from where you're at, but I do. I, saw, I, I keep. I a, saw it early on. He's got a Coug hat. <laughs> he keeps it here. <laughs> that is so it, strategically placed. When you live in Wisconsin or I've lived all over Peoria, Illinois, Midwest, you don't ever see a Coug hat. And in Bozeman, where I currently live, uh, there's a lot of coops out here. It's, it's surprising. I think a lot of people from Washington have moved over to Montana. And so you regularly see, you know, WSU license plates and things like that. And uh, I invariably, when I see somebody in a grocery store with a coop hat, I just go, no coops. And they, they answer you back exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? That's pretty cool. We get, I see, I see just a couple here in Wisconsin. And the funny thing about that, whenever I go home, like I'm like, oh my god, a coog hat, and then I'm like, oh wait, no wait, that actually it's makes sense normal. here. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, well, cool. Let's should we? Let's I think go, we should. Let's talk, let's talk about air guns. Let's talk about, about air guns. And Mike, like I said, you know about just everything under the sun, but air guns is is a really cool topic, and I feel like it when you get involved in the outdoors, like you you kind of generally or or at least shooting oftentimes you're introduced you start with air guns and then maybe you graduate to rim fire and then center fire and then kind of those air guns 
tend to get forgotten. Like, oh, that that's a kid's, you know, a kid's thing. That's a learning tool. You know, now I'm, I'm on to bigger and better things. But uh, maybe we shouldn't be thinking about them that way. No, you're right. And I think as Americans, because we have such access to firearms, we do think that way, right? It's like, as soon as you can graduate to a 22, you graduate to a 22. And I did, and you did, like everybody did, or a 410 shotgun. You know, I've been lucky enough in my career to hunt every continent. I've hunted extensively through Europe and Africa. And, and in those countries where they don't have the ability to have firearms like we do, air guns rule the roost. I mean, it really is. They, they have their big game rifles, but since they're limited on number of firearms they can own, and it, depending on country, maybe it's four, maybe it's six. But it, I remember being in Sweden and they were uh, – I was talking to some gun shop guys and they were extolling the great gun laws of Sweden. They go, oh, we got the best gun laws in all of Europe. Uh, you know, with four years of training, we can own upwards of six firearms. And I laughed and they kind of looked at me. I go, I've got six firearms in my pickup at any given time. I mean, <laughs> all with, and they're just like, oh, you're kidding. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's America. You know, we have tons of guns. But in those cultures, the air guns have filled that void that, uh, that we don't really appreciate until recently you know now i think american consumers not because of regulations but because urbanization it's quiet you can plank with them you can hunt with them in areas that may not be deemed safe with a firearm um you know they're relatively affordable and i think more importantly in today's day and age if you've been down to any one of your local gun shops you can't find ammo i mean 22 shotgun centerfire it is almost impossible where air guns are still really easy to obtain ammo for, pellets for. Uh, you can cast them yourself in many cases. People make their own pellets. Um, and they're cheap. I mean, buy thousands of them for what the price of a couple boxes of 22 shells cost. So there's a lot of advantages to them from practice to hunting, small game traditionally. But I think we're seeing more and more you know, big bore air gun resurgence is finally kind of hitting America where people are using big bores to hunt big game with. What uh? What's the extent of when we say big boars? Like, what are we getting up to? I like in size 50, and fifty. Fifty caliber, yeah. I mean, this goes back to marketized earliest days. I mean, back at Cabell's twenty some years ago, I started getting into this and doing some research on it. And at the time, the only company that made a true big boar, which I think was a thirty caliber, maybe a nine millimeter, and then they got into some forties. Was a company called Quackenbush Air Rifles, and it was a one man shop. And they were kind of coveted in the air gun world. And he never really, they never got known because the guy had a horrible web page. He wouldn't answer his phone. I called him repeatedly. I remember being at Cabell's call and saying, I'd like, to, I'd like to buy one. And there was a multi-year standing list to buy one. I go, okay, how about I pay you in full? And when it's done, it's done. It's two years from now, just, you know, send me one. When it's done, no, I don't do that. Just log on to my website and, uh, you know, when they're available, that I put 20 of them up at a time and they sell out. And that's how he ran a business. And, it, you know, so therefore it never got to the masses. <laughs> uh, a really bad business model. But then you started seeing, you know, ben, well, to step back a little bit, you know, we all grew up with a spring gun or a, a brake barrel gun, which is essentially a spring charge gun or a CO2 gun, which are great for plinking, great for training, marginal for small game. But when you step into a something really suitable for hunting. It's a PCP, a pre-charged pneumatic, which is, you know, a very high pressure air tank uh, attached to the firearm, either as the buttstock or in some cases the forend. Um, and, and that has now become pretty popular. You know, I mean, you're seeing Benjamin Air Force led the way in that uh, and multiple hot on multiple other companies now make PCPs. So that's really the starting point of where you want to get uh, for, a, for a hunting powerful air gun. And then, to your point, you're seeing them in 30 calibers, nine millimeters, 458, 457, uh, 50 calibers. You know, and they're they're getting real serious projectiles coming out of them. PCP, hell of a drug. <laughs> that it is, Jim. Uh, these these big tanks, you know. Like I think if if you're familiar with air guns, like you said, you know, you, you got your pump, you got your pumps, you've got your your spring piston you've got uh you know your, your small like co2 tanks i guess which are you know those little silver jobbers and they kind of a, are almost like a miniaturized version of these bigger tanks that you're seeing on on these uh you know bigger bigger bore air rifles but how do you how do you charge those how, how are you putting the or what's even in those tanks yeah what's the ghost it's, sauce? It's yeah it, it's interesting you look at like the co2 we grew up with and I'll, somebody will probably correct me here but it's relatively low pressure. It's 800 foot pounds or something like that. 
Uh, when you get into the PCP guns, you know, they, the tank is built into them and they're rated over 3000 PSI in those tanks. So and I think that was some of the barrier to entry. There's definitely, when you get a break barrel pellet rifle that we all know, it's simple. You break it open, put a pellet in it, close it, shoot it. It's, it's that simple. When you get into a PCP gun, um, there's a lot more things you have to have. You either got to charge it with a hand pump and it's not, it looks like a bicycle pump. Uh, but it is a 3,000 PSI bicycle pump. Uh, or you charge it with a scuba tank. That's the easiest and most convenient. That's what everybody's kind of gone to, is that you just get a scuba tank. You can charge your gun's tank depending on the size of the gun, depending on you know the caliber. Obviously, uses a lot more air on a bigger caliber gun. But they, you know, you can charge it dozens of times off a, a normal size scuba tank. So you can run down to a scuba shop and get it filled in almost any town of any size. It's got a scuba shop there, cost you five bucks. And then it's a real simple two second process just to put a connector adapter between the scuba tank and the gun. Just got kind of almost like an air compressor, quick detach fitting that snaps on, charge it up, unplug it, and you're ready to shoot. Uh, a lot of guys will bring those two to range when they're doing a lot of shooting with them. Um, but for hunting, you know, you'll generally just charge your tank or in some cases, like I've taken them to Africa, you'll end up bringing small little pony tanks that are carbon fiber and lightweight and you can carry one in your backpack or your truck and you can charge your gun four or five times and the gun's good for several shots per charge. So that's, that's kind of the genesis. And then you can step all the way up into compressors and high volume or high pressure pre uh, compressors. I have one of those uh, from Air Force. It works great. You plug it into the wall and it's a compressor that'll put out 3000 PSI and you can charge your own scuba tanks off that. Hmm. Oh, gun. really? That's pretty yeah. cool. With the compressor, is that a slower process then than like off the tank? Like is the tank just like a big force of air or is it controlled yeah. too? Or Well, the way you want to do it, I think, is run your compressor into your or scuba tank and then have your scuba tank charge and then it's just a, to your point you know it's amazing how much heat is generated when you're transferring high compressed air from one tank to another so you kind of do it slow you know they recommend you hook it up kind of feel the hose and you, you crack your scuba tank and and then it you know slowly bleeds air in but even when you're doing it slowly uh it's still just 30 seconds 40 seconds it's not a lot you know hmm. i've got one actually i've got a uh new hot saw they just sent me which is kind of an interesting rifle but that's your this one's a carbon fiber wrap look uh, at that tank right there so in this case that's you know the tanks mounted in the forehand and then your charging point is right underneath where it just snaps in and charges but that's oh. a essentially a pcp rifle and this oh. one's in 30 caliber okay gotcha and physically Wild. physically that's a pretty large rifle there uh is it what are they what are they like i mean is it pretty is it pretty uh hefty when you're carrying it around one of these things or well, are they actually pretty lightweight the reason this, one, the reason this one's so big uh it's I, it's not really a hunting gun there's some interesting things with air and i don't know if this will ever become outlawed or not but this is a fully automatic 30 caliber gun that shoots like 70 grain lead pellets and it takes a rotary magazine i think 16 rounds it pops in there and it's a fully suppressed barrel too. Since they're air, they're not regulated by the BATF like a firearm would be. So things like suppressors, not regulated. Things like full auto, not, not currently regulated. So when I got this thing, I took it out. It's got just like a semi-auto switch, a full auto fun switch. So I put it on semi-auto and I shot a few shots. I'm like, oh, it's kind of interesting. Put it on full. It's like shooting an MP5. It just, like, oh boy, that's, that's legit. Uh, it's a really serious full auto air rifle. And they've made these, it's the blitz, I think they call it. They've made them in BB guns before, uh, pellet guns. We've all seen those. We've shot them at the fair. But this is the first one I've really played with. It's of a serious caliber. And you can see on the bottom, almost any PCP will have that. I have a dial built in. It shows you your amount of pressure, amount of pressure left, cool. things like that. It's just a dial gauge. Okay. Dude, that is legit. That is awesome. And since, uh, like you said, I mean, with air rifles too, since they're not technically a uh, – a, a regulated item like regular firearms that we use that's something you can get shipped right to your house too right well right to, it came right to the door kind of like a kind of like a muzzle loader too yep yep the thing with them too is that full autos are fun in, in my job with guns and ammo you know we get an opportunity to shoot a lot of military full autos and they're fun except they're really expensive to shoot right i mean even <laughs> if you have them in 
nine millimeter, it's still expensive to rip rounds with a, with a full auto. So with this, you get all the fun of a full auto at a couple cents a shot, you know, or even less probably, right? A penny a shot. So it's a really a fun opportunity. But from a hunting standpoint, which we're really talking about, uh, these are kind of my go-tos. Uh, these are Air Force Air Rifles. They make several different models. This is a Stealth, I believe, but I've got multiple of these. Condor, Stealth. This is an unsuppressed version. I've got fully suppressed versions. Uh, obviously, they utilize the air tank in the back, uh, not in the front. Okay. And, and we make a couple models with the front as well. But they, they just incorporate it into the stock. It's lightweight, super simple, single shot, and you just pull them back, put a pellet in them, close them, take the safety off, and fire them. That's it. And just reload them, obviously, just bring the cock and put another pellet in. So from a hunting standpoint, and they make these everything from 17 up to 50 caliber now. Um, I ended up taking one of these to Africa, to Namibia. It's been five, six years ago uh, when they came out with their Texan model, of course, called the Texan. It was in uh, 458. And that thing fired a 350 grain, 4570 slug. I mean, lead, full flat nose slug at about 800 feet a second. And at 100 yards, it would hold them within an inch. I mean, you just could overleaf these big slugs. And it, it's an amazing hunting tool. It, you know, it's very similar to shooting something with a, a 12 gauge slug or a muzzleloader slug. It does not have nearly the energy that either of those do. But as far as penetration and what it does to an animal, I, mean, I ended up shooting Gemsbuck, a couple of uh, warthogs, springbuck. I don't think I ever recovered a bullet. It's going slow and it just shoots through both shoulders and keeps going. Much like an archery kill, uh, the animal runs off. You don't get any kind of shock value like you do with a high-powered rifle, but you follow the blood trail and you'll find a dead animal. I mean, it's a really effective tool. Wow, that's amazing. What uh, You mentioned that one is, is unsuppressed. Now, I, I guess I wouldn't have thought of really suppressed or not would have even crossed my mind so much with an air gun. What is an unsuppressed versus a suppressed like shooting those? Is it still hearing safe even if unsuppressed or not quite? Yeah, they're hearing safe, but they're loud, shockingly loud. When you get into the, the big bores, they're pushing a ton of air uh, down the bore and they're they're loud. They're you know on par with a 410 probably, maybe not as high decibel rating, but it, it'll, it's shocking how loud they are. Uh, and the recoil, believe it or not, you wouldn't think of recoil, but you know, when you're shooting a 350 grain slug at 800 feet a second plus, there's, there's some kick to it. You know, it's not horrible. It's not, you know, I'd probably put it like a, like a 410, you know, something like that, a 410 shotgun. Okay. But it definitely jumps definitely loud. The suppressors, though, are very nice. And, and the air guns lend themselves really well to it because most of them, especially in the hunting calibers and the heavy bullets, are doing less than the speed of sound anyway. So, you know, I run suppressors on a lot of my centerfire rifles, uh, which will reduce the, uh, you know, the actual deafening capabilities and the, you know, the, you know, damaging uh, properties, but it still, since they're sub or supersonic cartridges, you still get that supersonic crack, you know, when you're shooting a 6.5 or a 223 or something like that. With an air rifle, you don't get that. It really works well. That's cool. Yeah, that's super cool. You know, and, and those tanks, like you're saying, like having it integrated into the butt stock or the forend, you know, in, in both those air guns, they did a really nice job of, like, I guess making it part of the rifle where it's not like this extra it thing like necessarily. A, it doesn't look like a squirt gun you had as a kid with the tubes all over it that you fill up with the hose. Like it doesn't quite look like that. Yeah. And then, you know, the carbon fiber, like I know from back in my, my limited volunteer fire days though, but like the, the difference between like a, a carbon tank and a steel is, I mean, carbon fiber is always light, but I mean, it's, it's a big difference. So that's gotta be, you know, those tanks, they look super bulky, but I don't think they, they don't probably aren't weighing a lot. Are they Mike? No, they don't. They're real, and you're right. Uh, you can get Air Force with, I, I imagine it's aluminum or carbon. It's either aluminum or steel. I don't know. Um, but the carbon ones are noticeably lighter. You know, when you put those on, they do, or you take two of them and feel them, like, holy smokes, it weighs nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, they're, they're fun. They definitely require, you know, some adapters, some thought process, some, you know, how I'm going to charge it. And when you take them on a hunt, there are things I didn't know. Uh, first time I went to Africa, I'm like, okay, I'm going to bring this tank with me. It was a carbon fiber tank. <clears throat> Had no air pressure. I read the TSA guidelines, no air pressure in it, fine. Packed it in my suitcase. I get all the way to Namibia, open up my, my bags. Guns there, pellets there. Uh, actually, that's something kind of funny. When you go to a third world country, 
they don't distinguish pellets from cartridges. Even though it's nothing more than a lead bullet, they still look at it like it's a cartridge and you've got a limit sure. of how many cartridges you can bring in there. So I, I both packed them into a box of fishing sinkers and they just looked, oh, fishing sinkers, great. And they, they let them go. They didn't even <laughs> um, but my scuba tank was missing. And I'm like, where is the scuba tank? You know, and you can't charge them without that. Luckily, I brought a, a hand pump with me uh, just as a backup plan. And sure enough, I mean, I, I got a note from TSA. So it was taken on the U.S. side, actually out of Seattle, of all places. And TSA goes, yep, we realize it was out of, you know, no air. But we have to be able to physically look inside of the tank. So with a, like on a scuba tank on the top, there's a big nut. And you can take that whole gauge system off it so they can visually inspect that. I wish they would have told you that ahead of time. I mean, that was a 300 and some dollar tank that TSA just took, you know, and you never get it back. So a couple points to think: if you're going to travel with one and you're going to fly, you know, take the top off your scuba tank or make arrangements to get a scuba tank there, hmm. uh, bring a backup charging mechanism, bring back up uh, adapter hoses in case you have to use somebody else's tank when you're there. I mean, it's just like planning a muzzle over hunt. You know, it's not as turnkey as say, you know, a center fire rifle. I mean, I got a box of ammo, I got my rifle, I got my scope, I got my range finder, I'm good to go. You need to kind of think through contingencies of what happens if uh, they do take a tank or you have a tank break because you won't find parts of these in most places in the world. You better bring your own with you. Yeah, yeah that is, it's an interesting like contrast or whatever. You look at like a fire or modern firearm, which is like such an effective you know, implement, right? Then you got a muzzleloader or an air rifle, which I mean, you are, it has limited ability compared to that, right? But also like, it's almost like harder to get it somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, boy, we really did figure out something something pretty fierce when we figured out how to put it all in just one cartridge with a bullet attached to it. That was, uh, that was just some smooth thinking. And think about that. I mean, you know, the operating pressure of a, a modern cartridge is anywhere from 30,000 to 60,000 PSI. You know, it, it's a heck of a lot of pressure inside of uh, the detonation of uh, gunpowder inside of a cartridge. Uh, you know, you compare that to an air rifle, it's 3,000. You know, 3,000 sounds extremely high when you're pumping it up, and it is, you know, but compared to what a modern rifle cartridge is, I mean, it's it's nothing. It's know, wild. It's just a reaction. Um. So with the, uh, man, you were talking about traveling. Something made me think about uh, traveling with these things, PSI. Oh, shoot. Now, of course, I blanked on it. But, yeah, it is pretty wild how much they are packing in there compared to a regular cartridge. Mark, you looked like you were about to say something, though. Oh, I was going to say, uh, so I guess compared to maybe like a traditional CO2 cartridge, right? Like if, if a person has, you know, shot a pellet rifle that's powered by that, it's like, you know, your first shots are, you know, full blast, and then it kind of starts to diminish over time, and then eventually, you know, they're rainbowing out. And you're like, okay, oh, it's time to time yeah. to replace that. With this style, does it do that same thing, or is it like the same amount of power each time until it kind of hits a threshold, and it's like, I'm not going to do that anymore? We are on the same page. You're exactly right. That's that's kind of how like those Air Force guns are made, where if you get one in 22 or 25 caliber, you'll get pretty consistent velocities for depending on caliber, depending on ball weight. And they have a dial on them that you can turn the power up or turn it down. Uh, but you have 50 shots, hundred shots, you know, without really seeing a fall off, you get into the big bores. And I have found like for hunting with that 458, 457 caliber gun, three shots, and then you're going to start seeing a fall off. Um, so when you're shooting, you know, for hunting, I have no problem firing three shots with it without a charge. At the range, I generally, if I'm really trying to dial in accuracy, I'll shoot one shot and I'll top it back off. One shot and top mm-hmm. it back off. Because you got a scuba tank and you'll just, and then you'll just get these clover leaf groups at 100 yards. It's amazing. But for hunting, you know, if you just fire three shots, it'll open up. You know, the first one will be here, second one will be an uh, inch down, and the third one will be, you know, an inch and a half, two inches down at 100 yards. Uh, obviously, you're losing velocity. Um, and then it starts really falling off after that. Yeah. Okay. And that's of the big bores. You know, if you go with a smaller bore stuff, you get a lot of shots between fills. That's cool. One of the really neat things I think about it is, uh, you know, you, you you talk about like a traditional muzzle loader or something like that. You've got more pieces to that puzzle to make it go off. Obviously, you have your powder you got to put down there. Um, you know, there's these uh, what are these veggie wad things or something like that that sometimes you're working with, and then you got the projectile. They can be a bit finicky with, uh, you know water or something like that. Like if you're in a really wet environment, you know, you got to make sure that you're keeping everything pretty environmentally sealed and stuff. But I mean, with this, in this case, 
you've got air and a pellet. I mean, the pellet goes in just by itself, right? So that probably, I feel like, is a little bit more peace of mind if you are in some more inclement weather. Yeah, I don't think inclement weather hurts them at all. Uh, I, you know, it's interesting. It kind of blends the best of both worlds between the muzzleloader world, which which I do a lot of that and I personally like, but it requires you to be very engaged and really know what you're doing, and especially if you shoot foot locks and traditional side lock muzzleloaders. Uh, it's much more finicky based on weather and moisture. Um Versus a high-powered rifle, you know, this is somewhere in between there where it's not as finicky to use, uh, but it makes, it's, it limits your range. I mean, yes, I shoot groups at 100 yards, but for hunting, I like to be within 30, 40 yards of an animal with a hmm. with an aircraft. You just don't have that much energy. You're pushing out 600, 700 foot-pounds of energy, which is a lot for an air rifle, but it's really not much compared to a centerfire rifle. So it, it takes the whole you know, long range game away. It really becomes a, a bow hunter with a pretty uh, precise, accurate uh, killing tool, but you still got to get within those bow kind of ranges. Gotcha. That's kind of neat. Gotcha. What kind of, you know, we're talking about kind of the big bores with like, you know, 800 feet per second with like a, you know, like a 17 or, or a 22 cal pellet. What kind of velocities are guys reaching with those with like, you know, like a high end modern, you know, souped up air rifle? You know, they can, I think there's some companies that have, you know, advertised 1,400, 1,500 feet per second. They're doing that with really light pellets, like, you know, uh, tin, uh, anemone type, hard tin pellets that are real light. Most of your hunting guys are using a heavier, they're sacrificing velocity for weight of pellets. So they're not as concerned with velocity. But in your 17s, in your 20s, 22s, 1,000, 1,100, 1,200 feet a second with a heavy pellet is a really, you know, you want that penetration, much like an arrow. I mean, you can shoot a super lightweight arrow and get it to go 400 feet a second, but on game, it doesn't work as well. So the guys are going, nope, I want a heavier, twice as heavy as what you commercially buy. It's places like Hunter Specialty, not Hunter Specialty, uh, Hunter Bullets, I think is the company's name, that makes specific cast heavy pellets in all, in 17 up through 50 caliber. And mm-hmm. they're generally very heavy for their weight uh, or heavy for their bore diameter. Okay. Um, yeah, so penetration is key. You really you don't have any energy, and that's the big advantage with like a centerfire rifle. I mean, when you're getting thousands of feet a second, you're getting this compounding effect e equals mc squared, all based on velocity. On this, you never get enough velocity to really give you that hydrostatic shock that you find with a centerfire rifle. So you want penetration. You have to aim for vitals, headshot, neck shot, or or breakthrough shoulders, you know, heart lung type thing. Uh, so penetration is king in air guns. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Now, speaking of, obviously, just the effectiveness of it and trying to be uh, as effective as possible, precise, hitting those spots that you were just talking about, um, I feel like a lot of times, certainly when uh, legalities are put around what what firearms, what cartridges, what uh, calibers can be used on certain game species and stuff, it has to do with that. So, what are the uh, what are the legalities, let's talk about U.S. primarily here, around using an air gun? Uh, is, it, is it still caliber dependent so that goes the same as your center fire rifle stuff or are air guns in their own category or it's a massive patchwork um of different laws by state of course uh interestingly enough we're doing a special section in our october issue of guns and ammo an eight or ten page section just on air gun hunting and part of that is is the legality of it and where you can do it and what we're going to do is drive people uh, to a link on our website that's got an interactive map that shows you what, you know, some states allow small game only. A handful of states let you do, you know, if it's a non-game species like a coyote, there's only a small percentage of states, Idaho, and I think Montana's considering it. Idaho, I think, just approved it, Missouri being another one, uh, that you can hunt deer with them. Uh, so, you know, there are some deer hunting, op- fair chase deer hunting opportunities with it. Of course, Texas is wide open. I mean, being private land, private game, they kind of do what they want. Um, but every state is very different on it and has different regulations by species, game, non-game, big game, you know, predator, etc. So, okay. yeah, you have to look into your own state to see. Yeah, whenever whenever we, when, whenever we talk about game regulations, you know, we always have the caveat of, you know, hey, check check your state game regulations, yeah, but this is like an extra check because I think yes. there's a lot of layers to this cake. Yeah. There is, and there's a lot of these states that are just starting to realize the power and performance of some of these big boy air rifles and go, oh, 
this could be a viable tool for hogs or for deer, you know, especially white tailed deer and tree stand type environments where you're shooting 20, 30 yards. So it's, it's ever evolving, you know, and I think the state game agencies are being pushed and you know, just like suppressors. It wasn't that many years ago where you couldn't hunt with suppressor. It was just not allowed. And now I think 40 some states allow the hunting with suppressors because you know, legislators were introduced to it. They were shown that, oh, this is not a poacher's tool, that no, you can still hear it. All you're really doing is protecting your hunter's hearing. And there's no, you know, disadvantageousness to the game. And, you know, by the time the bullet gets there, the game's already dead by the time they hear the shot. So, you know, once those, you know, concerns were were raised and, and covered with game agencies, the laws have been ever evolving very rapidly. And I think you'll see mm-hmm. that with their guns too. Mm-hmm. Across the same way. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of it's just, you know, it's like an edu- education thing, right? You know, and as more information and, and technology, you know, gets to places where it's like, you know, maybe at one time, maybe it wasn't, wasn't, wouldn't be an effective enough tool, but now it is. Or even, you know, we've been doing some stuff with 410s lately, you know, from not that long ago, probably a 410 may not have been the best choice to hunt turkeys. Now with, you know, TSS loads and things like that, you can, it's a very effective turkey shotgun, you know, so. Yeah. Well, the cool thing with air guns too is just the, uh, the places you can go hunt with them outside the U.S. You know, we went down to, we, we forget, you know, we get so jaded in the U.S. of our, our easy access to firearms. You forget there's all kinds of countries that don't allow firearms, you know, ownership or, or otherwise, but air guns are always pretty on the books. I remember I was uh, in Turkey on an Ibex hunt using a normal center fire rifle and you'd see locals all the time with air guns, little break action, Chinese made air guns that they're shooting pigeons with and starlings and eating small game with it. Um, we went down to Puerto Rico, which is kind of strange. And it's a U.S. protectorate, but they've got extremely restrictive gun laws. Hmm. So I went down there a number of years ago with Hotson, uh, air rifle company, the same company that makes that full auto one. And they had done a deal with these local mango and papaya orchard owners that iguanas are thick down there. And they, they're an invasive species. They never, I think they were like pet store iguanas that got loose on Puerto Rico 30, 40 years ago. And they are everywhere. And so we went down there with pellet guns, fully legal, couldn't bring a 22 or anything. And we shot hundreds and hundreds of iguanas out of these orchard trees. And these farmers were just beside themselves because, you know, they were just getting eaten out of house and home by these iguanas. And it was kind of funny since they don't really have a culture of hunting there. You know, I asked, I'm like, you guys eat these iguanas? And I'm like, oh, no, 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 touch them. I said, I know they do it in Mexico. Let's try them. So we peeled all the tails and they were awesome. And everybody goes, yeah, it tastes like chicken. It was a little better, it was a little meatier, denser white meat. But we deep fried a bunch of iguana tails down there and all the locals ate them up and killed a bunch of iguanas. That was all because of you know, pellet guns. You wouldn't have done it with a rifle. Yeah, that's that super amazing. It's awesome. Jim and, Jim and I, we just, uh, uh, we hunted. Uh, we were hunting Nebraska a few weeks ago during a cold snap, a Neg eighteen cold snap. No iguanas there. No iguanas there. But I, in the hotel room that we're in, we got uh, outdoor channel and sportsman channel. So I pretty much left that on uh, the entire time. That well, I think I just left my TV on, so it was on for a couple of days. But uh, I saw like a uh, an advertisement for I think I think it was like a an all air gun based show that you guys have on the network air gunner, yeah yeah and yeah. they were shooting iguanas and i was like what the heck is this um so then hearing you talk about it like that was the catalyst for this podcast i remember you were just infinitely intrigued a <laughs> big iguana guy over here yeah it might have been the sport of kings guys it was one of the funnest things i've ever done it just because it was such a target rich environment you didn't feel they're lizards you don't feel bad about shooting them they were good to eat uh, you were doing the farmers a big favor. They were appreciative. It was tropical beaches and you'd go out and surf fish and hang out in the afternoons. But this mornings, we just walked these river courses with big old, like, you know, uh, Medi- not Mediterranean, but Caribbean hardwood trees and river bottom. And every tree you looked at was just covered in iguanas. And it was just, you ran out of pellets, you ran out of air. Just <laughs> got the heck out of them. It was, it was like prairie dog shooting was something you could eat, you know. Holy mackerel, plan wow. the honeymoon. Oh my gosh, this is new pod venture. Uh, lock yeah. it in. Actually, yep. All right, MC Ryan, we'll we'll write it down. Man, that is cool. <sighs> I can't stop thinking about these damn iguanas. What the heck else was I thinking It just sounds about? like paradise. Surf yes. fishing, strolls in the tropics, shooting iguanas oh out of trees gosh. with air guns. Um, All right. Hold, yeah. What? You go. What? You go. 
Okay, I was going to switch the topic back to air guns, if that's okay with you. Well, that's what I, that's what I was going to do. I, here's what I want to ask. So we're talking about them being kind of like a close range weapon, which I guess they are. But I see a lot of guys doing uh, on uh, on different YouTube channels and things like this, kind of like long range air gunning. I guess you know contextually, you know. But um, doing all the things like you, a precision rifle person would do, but with an air gun, I mean, they're getting their dope, you know, they're dialing elevation, they're doping wind, um, but they don't need the crazy room like you do with a centerfire, right? Like you're kind of doing oh, these right. things like at, at a shorter range uh, scenario. What's what's going on with that, Mike? What are you seeing in that that aspect of it? It's Well, it's fun in its own right, but it's also great training because everything you just mentioned, I mean, the, the drop and the doping of wind and you can do it in a much smaller area. You can do it and the guns are more than capable accuracy wise. I mean, if you ever followed any of the Olympic air gun sports, which you've got running bore uh, in the in the Olympics, you've got, you know, position, small bore, three position, small bore. I mean, if you look at, you know, Walther, for example, I was over visiting uh, Walther in Germany two years ago before COVID. And I mean, their biggest segment, at least in Europe, is their competitive target grade air guns. I mean, multi thousand dollar, amazing pieces of machinery. Um, but it's, it's an Olympic sport. So, you know, the guns are more than capable and they shoot generally close range indoor competition. But as you start taking these specifically designed precision air guns to longer distance, everything from trigger pull to cant of the gun to wind to you know drop all comes into even a more magnified play in a shorter distance than we're used to with center fire so it's a great training tool which in addition to the precision game i mean we see we've got a few articles coming out this year because of the ammo shortage of the uber realistic ar platform handgun clones that are just like a sig or just like you know, a Ruger, whatever, of guys training, you know, both indoors and outdoors with them. And, you, you know, it's, once again, cheap to shoot, easy to do, it's quiet, and all the fundamentals are there. You're learning, you know, your trigger squeeze, you're learning your follow through, you're learning sight picture, all with an air gun. So that's outside of the hunting realm, but it's a very viable tool for that, especially in today's day and age of not being able to get ammo. Mm-hmm. With, with like those high end air guns, you know, you're talking about trigger squeeze and things like that. Um, are they, are I mean, like are they coming with like a really good trigger or is that going to be very similar to like a center fire trigger or does it have a different oh, feel? Yeah, what do they feel like? Better, better in a lot of cases, especially with match grade stuff. I mean, you know, it's not unheard of to get two ounce triggers, things like that. I mean, ooh, super ooh. super light. Yeah, really crisp, really you know. I mean, Lothar Walther barrels are world class barrels, and you know the triggers are fantastic, and just everything is, you know, every bit is precise, if not more so in some cases as a really good center fire rifle. And once again, European market, right? I mean, you know, they can't get the access to guns. They don't have the shooting ranges like we do. Um, so they've really driven that technology um, yeah. to a higher level. And it, it's funny, you know, I, I kind of worry about like this full auto in the sense that the BATF currently does not regulate anything with, a, with air guns. With the power and, you know, the full auto capabilities, I'm not so sure that they, you know, I hope they don't, but they they may get into that regulatory market. They surely have in Europe. I mean, it, it, they have power levels that they can sell in Europe and they're, they're low. I mean, they don't get these big bore hunting air rifles like we do. They get 177s, they get 22s. And I can't remember the exact, they don't use foot pounds of energy. It's joules, but it comes out to be, you know, it's like, 20 foot pounds of energy. It's really, there truly are pellet guns, you know, and uh, because they try to regulate the, not try, they have regulated those very effectively, uh, just like their guns have been regulated. Wow. Brutal. That's brutal. That is brutal. You know, but I then, mean, but then when you go over there and visit, you can bring over the air guns that you have and they somehow. I've never done it in Europe. I've never brought over. Uh, oh, okay. I've powered air rifle to Europe. I've brought them into Africa, which is, they don't know how to even look at it, right? I mean, it's, it's such a foreign concept to them that they just go, I, I don't know if there's any regulations or not. Um, it does not appear yeah, to be. Take it, sure. <laughs> I brought a crossbow into Zimbabwe, and it's still debatable whether or not it's even legal to have one there. I don't know. I mean, I got to customs, and they went, never seen one. I guess go ahead and take it. <laughs> so I put <laughs> it a crossbow, and I filmed an entire TV show shooting critters with it, and, you know, the laws in Africa are, are not nearly as defined as they are, you know, in stateside or specifically in Europe. 
Yeah. Okay. How does how does that work? They send you a letter. Hey, we need you to come back to jail. Yeah, and they, uh, it truly would be a letter because in most parts of Africa, email is uh, not something you wouldn't get an email. You'd get a, a printed Courier Express letter, I'm sure. <laughs> Hopefully Man. not Carrier Pigeon because most of the YouTube videos that I see on these air guns, guys are <laughs> pretty hard on the pigeons. That was my youth growing up. We had a barn right next to our house, and I remember I had a Crossman 606 or a 909. It was a 22 caliber pump up pellet rifle and i thought that was the sport of kings is go in there in the winter time or under bridges in north bend and places like that and just flashlight pigeons on the roost and i used to just hammer pigeons most i still enjoy it i haven't done it in 20 years but i would still enjoy going to do it i've hunted everything in the world that i'd still rate pigeons up there's one of the funnest things you can go do so man yeah that's uh that is good fun um getting to get into the air guns here, let's talk about like the big bore ones. Obviously, you held yours up. You had a scope on top. Uh, a lot of people are shooting these. Obviously, when they're shooting precision, they're putting optics on top, hunting with them. Uh, one of the things, man, this was a bigger thing back in the day. When I, when I say back in the day, I mean only like uh, six, seven years ago. We were getting tons of questions from people. Uh, are your scopes rated for air guns? We still get the question. Not as much. Because it seems like, I mean, I know we we made sure all of our scopes were rated for air gun use, and I think a lot of other people have been making sure of that. But I, I know for a period of time there, probably even still depending on what you look at, air guns would actually tear scopes up. I mean, it was they were they were scope killers more so than anything else. That's you know any other center fire, big cartridge, big shooting, high powered thing. I mean, air guns were just wreck scopes. You know why that is? They and got, it still does. It still does. It's a reverse recoil. All so right. I show this one, but this one is, you guys will love the optics on this. This is like vintage, vintage 1980s. And it was the first air guns, little Bushnell Banner 22 scope on this. So this is an RWS Diana, which is, as you know, a break barrel cock design. And as that works, like the Gamos and any of the other break barrel style guns, there's a spring that comes back here that drives forward, pushing a column of air down the barrel. So in this in this type of gun, all you you get is violent recoiling forward, not rearward like you do a normal scope. So most of your optics are braced to accept rearward recoil, uh, and, and these Springer guns will still tear up a, a scope of of any quality. I mean, you, know, you look at anybody's scope if it's not designed for a, this type of Springer air rifle, yeah, it'll destroy it. With those PCPs, they're direct rear recoil like uh, like any set mm. gun. So you're not getting that kind of you know slamming forward and slamming back like you do with this type of gun. Got That's it. probably more why you don't hear about that as much because anything CO2 based or air gun tank you know PCP based, you, you don't get that. But yeah, these will still do it. Got it. Shot a lot of crows with this gun. This was a fun crow gun. I used to whack crows on a pretty regular basis with this. <laughs> Oh, Mark, somebody who actually hit the crows. What are you talking about? They're hard to hit. Well, Everybody I know around here says that every time they shoot at crows, it seems as though they, they vanish for a second. The Well, I mean, I, I am a firm through. believer. Crows are, uh, man, I think that they got a weird spirit to them, man. I don't know. They kind of, there's just something different about them. I know, like, it was my quest as a kid to kill a crow with my air rifle. And I, you, I swear, you point a gun at a crow, and they just know to fly away like i had to be pretty sneaky i finally knocked one down but oh you did but the, there's just some, there's something different i don't know mike can you speak to crows speak to crows you've shot a lot of them apparently <laughs> well yeah we used to have a gun shop that mark spent two years ago in, in washington and uh, early in the morning we would bait that parking lot with <laughs> guys, and we'd keep the door of the gun shot open shop open and those crows would come in there and just be eating fries and we'd sit back on the, the gun counter itself with that air rifle as a matter of fact and, and shoot them right in the parking lot uh way before you know there's any customers or anything it was a real early in the morning but we had a black lab with us it was always in the shop the shop dog and we trained <laughs> we trained him to fetch crows <laughs> run the, and he despised it it was so beneath him he'd pick up these crows i don't know if they smell bad or the feathers taste bad or what, but you can just see this grimace on this black lab's face of bringing a crow back and we wouldn't even touch him. We'd have a trash can and he'd drop them in the trash can and we'd tie it off and, and get rid of them. But yeah, we used to shoot a lot of crows that way. But baiting, <laughs> baiting is the key to crows. Yeah. 
did, McDonald's you, French fries specifically. You weren't using that enough fries. Enough, I don't think there's, even if there's a law against it, it was 25 years ago, so I'm well outside of that. You know, uh, statute limitations. Yeah, so. I mean, yeah, I mean, at this right, at this point, it's really just a story, anyway. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it may or may not even be true. Who yeah, knows? Yeah, <laughs> you know, guy could um, be crazy. Just making up stories. Got to get them. Got to get them distracted with the fries. L- let me ask you this, Mike. I mean, did you? Ever, I mean, they seem quite wary, though. Like, did you ever notice some peculiar peculiar things when they'd see you? Like, if they did see you aim at them, like they're like, "I'm out of here." Oh, yeah, no, crows are one of the smartest animals out there. No, I mean, birds anyway, for sure. No, we had had to stay back in the shop. There was no opening a window or a door once they were there. They would fly off. You had to have the door propped open. You had to be behind the counter. And, yeah, they were very savvy. And, and they, once you shot a few of them, they got even more savvy. <laughs> Sitting trees and look around and, yeah. But, no, we used to do a lot of it. Uh, I used to call crows quite a bit with electronic game calls actually out in the forest. I think I've probably done that with you once, twice, Mark. Mm-hmm. And, and that's fun. I mean, they come in like way better than ducks or geese ever will. And they all of a sudden you have no crows in the air and you've got crows all over you. But once you shoot a couple, that spot's gone. It's like calling predators. I mean, you got to go to a different spot after that. I mean, that is, we're totally tangenting, but that is super wild. I mean, they come, like you said, they could be not anything. And then like from miles, like you just yeah. see them come from miles. I, I, I turned the collar on at our uh, house one time. And Crystal got super creeped out because I said it on the front porch, and you could hear them on the roof, like their little crow feet, you know, scratching around. She's like, "You got to turn that thing off." Ooh, man, I have yet to do this. I got to try this. We why got the. We, why have we done this? We yet? got the e collar. We should go do that. We should. Um, uh, golly, I'm trying to think, Mike. Did we have we missed anything? No, I mean, look, it's a, it's a. I think it's a fun rule. I think it's something that, especially for like predator hunters and guys really want to challenge. I've, I've hunted coyotes with some of these uh, PCP air guns in the 25 to 30 caliber range and keeping your shots under 75 yards. I, I've done it a few times in Nebraska and uh, other places and it, it's fun. I mean, you can, it really hones your skills as a hunter and that's something that, you know, there's no effective reason why unless you were legislated that you had to use air guns there's no real effective reason why you know unlike a crossbow yep gives you a bigger advantage than a vertical bow uh an inline muzzle loader gives you a bigger advantage over you know a flint lock and, uh, and obviously a precision long range rifle gives you the ultimate advantage there's no advantage to an air gun um except it's fun it's a challenge you know if you yeah. have you know shot a lot of critters and you want to try something different uh, it'll really hone your skills as a hunter you know if you stay within bow range you know, we all get kind of enamored, I think, with the long range hunting. And, and I don't personally. I like long range shooting. Uh, I'm, I enjoy hunting for the act of getting really close to an animal. And, you know, I've done a lot with a bow, but I also like the effectiveness of a rifle. So this kind of makes you get close like a bow hunter and you still have an effective tool like a rifle. And, and I enjoy that. It's just kind of a fun challenge to try. And whether you try it for coyotes or small game or for even big game in certain places, Texas, Missouri, Africa, it's a lot of fun. That's I super cool. I also love the fact you can just have one shipped right to your house and you can find pellets apparently. That's the world I like to live in, Jim. What a concept. What about, and that was probably the perfect wrap up, so I'm probably going to ruin it. But like, I feel like, you know, air guns or air gunning or hunting with air guns, like it's definitely like less common than other methods. But, you know, the little that I've, dove into it there's a lot of cool like resources out there i mean it's kind of like this really neat subculture there's a lot of good information that a person can get yeah no you're exactly right there's some really good stuff online in intel there uh and you know when you called and asked about hey who'd like to do an air gun podcast i've got guy and, and i and i proffered myself when I normally wouldn't, you know, I normally, if I look at Tom Beckstrand for long range shooting or Jeremy Stafford for handguns or you know, David Draper's editor of Peterson's hunting, and these guys are all really experts in their various fields. Even among our organization, I, without sounding cocky, have by far the most knowledge about air guns just because I've done it. But I look at our 40, 50 editors, writers, most of them have not played with them that much. You know, they just, they've kind of shot, some different ones at events, things like that, but they haven't dove into that. It definitely is a, a niche thing that very few guys do. I've never met a guy afield air gun hunting, um, except when we were like in you know Puerto Rico with a group of us, but never just randomly met a guy afield. But if you do get into it, it seems like everybody's really helpful because it is niche. You know, there's a ton of information online. You can just go down these rabbit holes of, of learning different stuff about air guns. So, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. 
That's awesome. I think above all, like you said, it just sounds fun. Air guns are fun. Are you going to do it? Should we get one? I feel like we should have an office air gun. I, it makes sense to me. It does make sense. Yep. I can hook you guys up with a few manufacturers. It makes, like I said, Air Force air guns from a hunting standpoint is one of my, my favorite ones out there. But Umarex makes great stuff and Hot Zone makes really good stuff. And there's a lot of different. And you get into the Europe, like FX and some other stuff out of Europe that are really high end. The, the Walthers, obviously, from the target side of things, are really high end. You know, it, it's interesting, too, the history of air guns. If you go back and we all know about Lewis and Clark, you know, that was one of the first, that was a PCP air gun. That was. 200 and 1804 it was a belgian made pcp air gun and if you go back i think there's one in the cody firearms museum in uh, wyoming i think it might be one at the nra museum but it's got a brass cylinder ball that they had a hand pump they'd pump it up to i don't think it was anywhere close to 3000 psi but it was obviously a, a high pressure tank and it fired muzzle loader balls and i think if memory serves correct it held like 14 rounds in a in a cylindrical magazine that they just dropped in one after the other. So it was one of the first repeaters out there and they were designed as, you know, weapons of war in the 1700s when flintlocks were still just the common item because a flintlock, as you guys know, I mean, it's slow, it's one shot, it's a wild fire with a, with a actual pre-charged air rifle. It's like, Oh, we got a repeater. It's one of the first repeaters ever made. And it, you know, shooting a 150 grain lead ball at probably 800 feet a second is deadly on a, on a human. So they were used, you know, the only downside, they were expensive. They were complicated to make and things like that. But for the armies that could afford them and the, the soldiers that could afford them, they were definitely the pinnacle of defensive firearms. Unbelievable. That was uh man. Now I feel as though I need an air gun out of some sort of classical American, uh, I don't know, just nostalgia, history, yeah. period, correct. I don't, yeah, M- Mike, I had no idea that those guys had an air gun. Oh, they say that was the most, the Giradoni, I think is, I may be mispronouncing that because it was a Belgian made gun. They say that was the only thing that saved Lewis and Clark from not having more conflicts along the route because. They did. They only had two of them, I think, one or two of them. And essentially, every group of Indians they met, they'd get it out. They'd say, check this out. They'd set up a bunch of bottles or whatever, you know, and they would r- rapidly shoot them down without ever taking a break and not reloading it. And there was no smoke. There was no noise. It was just pop, 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 pop. And I guess these natives were like, oh, my God, there's, you know, 35 guys here in this uh, band. They all got these. we got problems. And it's kind of credited that rifle as being the, the one thing that caused – or you know, one of the few things that allowed them to have so few skirmishes with the Indians across their route from Missouri to the Pacific and back was was that air rifle. Incredible. <laughs> I'm gonna It'd I'm gonna like I'm gonna show you this and I'm gonna let you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> yeah. Well yeah, that's essentially it was a show of force. I mean it was just I like mean, yeah. they never said it. We only got one of them and we gotta pump it up <laughs> and it. You know, they made it out like we all got these and they're they're pretty cool. We can shoot a lot of people with them, you know. And, no, I, I, I had a total side story. But yeah, I followed the Lewis and Clark Trail on a road trip from Missouri all the way to the Pacific and then back. And uh, you go and look at all those areas they stopped. And uh, it was it was pretty crazy. So, you know, they had no conflicts with the Indians. The only place they ever had a, a conflict was uh, up with the Blackfeet. They had they shot a Blackfoot Indian, and that was the only conflict. And I think it was Lewis or Clark, one of the two, I don't recall this at the moment, was shot by one of his own guys in the hunting party with a muzzleloader uh, in the buttocks. And the guy vehemently denied it. I mean, was like, no, I, I was shooting at an elk. He's like, no, you shot me. And they pulled the slug out, and it was exactly what they were all were using. And the guy still denied it and said, no, nah, I, I was shooting at an elk. You must be mistaken, even though these are the only two guys within 100 miles that had a muzzle over. But, yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. But the air rifle played a major role in that. That is awesome. Why didn't I learn that in history class? Why didn't Seriously. Why didn't I learn the most interesting, interesting thing about the expedition? Honestly, that's amazing. Hmm. Got to do some more research on. I'm going to write a letter to the LNC. school board, have them include that. Teach your kids. Teach your kids that. <laughs> they, they need to know. Man, it's fantastic. Mike, thanks a ton. That's all I got, guys. You've now drained me of anything I know about air guns. So you well, it was a lot. <laughs> well, we'll hopefully recharge and we'll visit again. But yeah, yeah no. That's right. Pump your head up or again with 3,000 PSI more of information. But uh, Mike, always, always a pleasure. Uh, always great chatting with you. Uh, I love you. I miss you. And yeah, fun conversation. And let's let's do it again about something else. 
you guys ever get out to Montana, let me know. We'll go out and do some hunting. Love to have you out. Awesome. Appreciate it. Same here. Thank Thank you. you, Stay well. All right. Thanks, Mike. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye, everybody. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.